I grew up in southwest Detroit. The house we lived in was well over a hundred years old. It used to be a two-family home, but after a fire sometime in the 1960s, it was modified into a one-family home. And because of that, it had a few strange characteristics. For instance, on the second floor, there was another full kitchen, living room, and bathroom, but no bedrooms due to the alterations. There was also an upstairs hallway that led to nowhere. It simply ended at a window. My family used that hallway for storage. To get up to the second level of the home, you'd open a door to what appeared to be a walk-in pantry in the main kitchen, but it was really hiding a set of old creaky stairs that led up to the second floor kitchen. The upstairs rooms all still had kitchen appliances and furniture from the 1950s. Aside from storage, my father used the upstairs to tinker around with broken appliances and TVs. He would repair things and sell them for extra cash. But other than that, the second floor wasn't used by us at all. All of our bedrooms were on the ground floor, and the door to the upstairs had a padlock on it. Dad would lock it every night before bed. As a really little kid, I never thought about how odd that was. It wasn't until I was seven years old that I learned there was a really good reason for the padlock. It was early fall, and I was just getting back into the routine of going back to school after summer vacation. Because of this, I was having trouble sleeping at an earlier bedtime, so I was still awake at 11 p.m. I was in bed listening to Mom and Dad softly talking in the kitchen when it happened. There was a loud crash, then the sound of glass breaking, and it seemed to be coming from the second floor kitchen. Whatever it was hit the ground with enough force that the pictures hanging on the wall over my bed were shaking. I ran into the kitchen where my parents were, asking what that was, but my mother shushed me as my father ran to get his gun and the keys to open up the padlock. In hushed tones, my dad said it sounded like somebody had broken through the window upstairs. Our neighborhood had a lot of crime in the early 80s, and we had several break-ins through the years. Dad handed the keys to Mom and told her to unlock the door as he stood there with his shotgun at the ready. He told us both to lock the door behind him and if we heard any yelling after he went upstairs, to call 911. I still remember the sound of Dad walking up those stairs, Mom and I listened to his footsteps on the wooden floor as he walked from room to room looking for intruders. But he found nothing. No broken window. No fallen furniture. In fact, nothing upstairs looked out of place at all. We never did find an explanation for that noise, and we were all scared for a few days. But then, when nothing else happened, we just dismissed it and went on with our lives. Although from then on... I became much more aware of the sounds that the house made. I realized that sometimes you could hear footsteps on the second floor at random times of the day and night. When I mentioned it to my mom, she told me that it was just the house settling. I always had the feeling of being watched upstairs, as if someone were peering at me from the darkness in the next room. Because of that, I always tried to keep my back to the wall when I was up there alone, so nothing could sneak up on me. The following summer it happened again. In the night, we heard the crashing and the sound of broken glass, but once again we found nothing to explain that noise. But this time, our next-door neighbor asked us what we had been up to the night before, because the noise was so loud it woke him up as well. Dad jokingly told him that the house must be haunted. Another time during the winter, I was in the downstairs kitchen coloring while Mom made dinner. It was already dark outside, and Dad was working the second shift, so we were home alone in the house. Suddenly, we both froze when we heard footsteps coming down the stairs from the upstairs kitchen. Our eyes were fixed on that pantry door when we realized that my dad had only put the lock in place, but he hadn't closed it. My mother quickly ran to the door and squeezed the padlock shut. Just as she did so, the knob began turning back and forth as though someone were trying to get out from the other side. The door shook for a few seconds, as if someone or something tried to force the door open. Then, everything just stopped. Later that night when Dad got home from work, 
he went upstairs again, gun in hand, to investigate. But once again, he found nothing. But from then on, he never forgot to close that padlock after coming down from being upstairs. One winter Saturday morning, I was up early watching cartoons, and my parents were still asleep in their bedroom. Suddenly, I heard the sound of breaking glass and felt a gust of cold wind. But this time, the noise came from the first floor, where I was. Like I said, we lived in a bad neighborhood, and we had just had a break-in a few months earlier. I ran back to the spare bedroom because that's where I thought I heard the noise, and that's where they broke in the last time. So we had the door locked from the outside now, to keep anyone from getting into the main part of the house once they breached the window. As I approached the room, I could see sunlight coming out from underneath the crack at the bottom of the door. That was concerning, because that bedroom had blackout curtains and there shouldn't be any light at all. Being the dumb kid I was, I knelt down on the floor to peer under the door to see what was going on in the room. I could feel cold air blowing on my face and saw light reflecting off the floor. All was quiet for a second. Then, two black shoes stepped into view and the door began shaking violently in the frame. My parents woke up when I screamed, and I met them in the hallway as I was racing to their bedroom. I told Dad that somebody broke into the back bedroom again, and they were trying to break down the door. Of course, when Dad went to investigate, nothing was out of place and everything looked normal. When he opened the door, it was dark inside, no light reflecting off the floor. They dismissed the whole thing and blamed it on my overactive imagination and they scolded me for waking them up so early on a Saturday morning. Another time, during a bright summer day, I was going to get something from the basement. When I opened the door to go down, I heard heavy footsteps rushing up the stairs towards me. I quickly slammed the door and ran for my mom, but of course, when she went to investigate, nothing was there. Mom died when I was 14, and things took on a much darker and ominous tone after that. I would often see shadows moving out of the corner of my eye, and both Dad and I thought we saw things gliding across the doorway, only to find nothing there when we turned to look. And that feeling of being watched was no longer confined to just the upstairs. It was throughout the entire house now. My father and I both fell into a deep, dark depression after Mom died, and Dad began to physically abuse me during this time as well. This was something that never happened before. And even though our financial situation hadn't changed at all, Dad began obsessing over finances, often insisting that we only turn the lights on in one room at a time at night. He would explode into a rage over the smallest expenditure of money on my part, even if it was money I earned on my own. Back then, I thought the depression we had was only because of Mom's death, and I'm sure some of it was, but now I also think that there was something dark and evil in that house, and it was feeding off the negative energy and making it worse for both of us. It was during that time that I began having dreams of an old woman in a tattered nightgown. She would stalk me through the darkened rooms of the house. In the dreams, I would try to be as quiet as I could be, but she would always find me. They always ended up the same way. The old hag would open up her mouth impossibly wide as she rose up off the floor and hung about a foot in the air. Then, she would fly straight at my face, screeching. I'd wake up so scared that I couldn't even make a sound when I tried to scream. Thirty years later as I write this, the hair on my arms is standing straight up remembering those nightmares. I began thinking this ugly old woman was the one who was menacing me from the shadows. She was the movement I caught out of the corner of my eye sometimes. But then again, I also wondered if I was going crazy and everything was just in my head. I had a friend sleep over one night. He and I stayed up playing video games until around 3 a.m., when we were getting ready for bed, he went to use the bathroom. A few seconds later, he came running back into my room, pale and scared. He said there was an old woman with long gray hair and a nightgown in the living room. At first, I thought he was just trying to scare me, until he begged me to come with him to stand outside the bathroom. He was too afraid to go alone. 
It was only then that I realized he was genuinely afraid, and I told him about my nightmares. He came from a very religious family, and he told me that it sounded like our house was haunted, infested by a demon, or both. A few weeks later, my cousin came to stay with us for the holidays. One morning, she complained about having bad dreams the night before. When I asked her what they were about, she told me they were about an old woman chasing her through the house while screeching at her. My cousin called her a banshee. After telling my friend this, he suggested that we do a blessing of every room in the house. But I knew my dad would never go for that. So we decided to do it ourselves. Dad was leaving town for a weekend a month or so later, and that's when we planned to do it. My friend and some guys from his church youth group came over while my dad was gone. They went from room to room and salted the four corners and read from the Bible. Nothing was happening, though, and I was beginning to think the whole thing was ridiculous. But then, as they said the final prayer, I began shivering. The room had gotten so cold you could see your breath in the air. As they finished the final prayer, they all jumped as if startled by something. I asked them what was going on, and they thought I was joking. I said no, I had no idea why they jumped. And they said they heard a loud crash coming from upstairs. I hadn't heard anything. But it was only then that I realized we hadn't blessed the upstairs rooms, and we couldn't. The pantry door was padlocked shut, and my dad had the only key. My friend said the blessing should keep the whole house free from evil, but he really didn't sound too sure. For about a year, things did quiet down, but eventually my dad grew even more violent, and I had no choice but to leave him alone in that house and go live with relatives. It was only then that my uncle told me the history of our house. My parents bought that house from his father-in-law. Now I have no way of verifying if any of this is true, but this is what he told me. The house had been in their family for generations, and the family had ties to Al Capone, so there were a lot of shady characters in and out of that home during Prohibition. During that time, their young son fell down the stairs and was crippled. He later died in one of the upstairs rooms. The boy's parents lived in that house until they were both very old. The wife outlived her husband by a number of years, and she stayed there alone while her mental health deteriorated. She began obsessing about her finances, and she was paranoid that people would break in and steal from her, so she bought a dog for protection. At some point, the neighbors noticed that the old woman hadn't been seen in a while, and she wasn't answering the door when they knocked. So they called her relatives and asked them to do a welfare check on her. They found the old woman hiding under her bed, emaciated and covered in her own filth. She had gotten so paranoid, she was even afraid to go out to buy food. So when she ran out of food, she ate the dog. The family had her committed to an asylum, and she lived there until she died. Years later, after my father moved out of that house, we patched up our relationship. He claims to have very little memory of the final years he lived in that house. He only knew he had to get out of there because he felt like he was losing his mind. When I told him what I heard about the history of the house, Dad told me one final thing that I think may be pertinent to the story. At some point when I was a kid, Dad needed to do some work on the plumbing, and he had to go in the crawl space under the house. It was only accessible from the outside. While working down there, he found a lot of animal bones, and they seemed to belong to large dogs. We have a family cabin in the middle of nowhere on a small lake surrounded by forest. About two miles away from the cabin and across a dirt road is a wildlife reserve. As kids, we used to play there all the time, but one day we decided to walk deeper into the woods. After about 30 minutes of walking straight through the reserve, we found a handful of abandoned houses. It looked like whoever had lived there had just up and left. In each house, there were still dishes on the table, clothing in the closets, 
Cars parked in the clearing, and there were all the strappings for horses in the barns. In one of the houses, the floor had caved in, and there were about 40 pair of women's shoes scattered around the hole. We decided to stay away from the second floor of the houses after that. We figured they weren't structurally sound. After we told my parents about our find, my dad wanted to come and have a look for himself. In one of the houses, we found a bedroom fully intact. The sheets were still on the bed, and the pillow still had the indentation of a head on it. But everything was covered in a thick layer of dirt, and the dust on the floors only had our footprints in it. On one of the beds, we found a stunning fur coat. There were a few moth holes in it, and it was dirty, but we knew it was real fur, likely silver fox, and it was gorgeous. Dad decided he was going to bring it home, clean it up, and see if he could have it resized to fit my mom. As we were leaving the house, I got a chill on the back of my neck. After walking about 60 yards away from the house, something made me turn back and look. I saw an old woman glaring down at me from the upstairs window on the second floor. She had her hair in a bun and was wearing a blue shawl and a white blouse. I suddenly felt super guilty that we'd been in her house and took her coat. So I grabbed my dad, who was about 10 yards ahead of me, and I told him we'd better put the coat back because the owner was still living there and she looked kind of mad. When we turned around and I pointed to the window, of course no one was there. I said she must have gone downstairs, and as we approached the house, still carrying the coat, one of the windows in the next house suddenly and loudly slammed shut. Well, I noped it out of there right back into the woods, but Dad being Dad, he stayed behind and started calling out to the old woman, asking her to come outside and saying he was sorry. When no one replied, Dad went inside and up to the bedroom, but no one was there, and the dust on the floor was undisturbed. Well, he freaked out, dropped the coat, and got out of there in a big hurry. About five years later, the government demolished all of those abandoned houses. I'm a realtor, and a few years ago I was helping an old friend of mine sell a house in Morrison, Colorado. For those of you who don't know Morrison, it's a tiny, quaint little town of about 500 people near the Rocky Mountains. My friend's mom had recently died of cancer in the house, and his father, distraught by the death of his wife, got drunk the night after and died accidentally by tripping and falling down a steep cliff while walking the dog. The dog survived, but his dad broke his neck and died. Fast forward a few months. I was doing a preliminary check of the house's condition, getting it ready to sell, when in the kitchen, a knife literally flew out of the drawer and across the room, narrowly missing me. After calming down, I convinced myself it was just a freak accident, and I carried on with my inspection. That afternoon, a snowstorm came through that essentially shut down the one road out of town. I called my buddy up and he gave me permission to stay in the house, but on one condition. I could sleep anywhere I wanted, but not in his parents' bedroom. He claimed the house sometimes made noise during snowstorms and it could get pretty loud, and he said the noise came from pipes that ran underneath his parents' bedroom. And sure enough, around 3 a.m. I began to hear noise, but it didn't sound like pipes. It sounded like a voice saying, get out. And the voice sounded demonic, and it scared the crap out of me. I ran outside and slept for the rest of the night in my car, freezing. The next day I woke up to find scratches all along the side of my car, and the inside of the house was trashed, just destroyed but there was no sign of a break-in whatsoever. I called the police and my friend to report what happened, and my friend decided to live in the house until it was sold to prevent any more break-ins. And that's when things got even weirder. One night, about a week later, he called me in the middle of the night from a highway rest stop. He asked me to please pick him up because he didn't have his car with him. 
I'm not even sure how I got here, he told me on the phone. Apparently, he had sleepwalked five miles in the snow in the middle of the night on the highway. I thought the stress of losing both his parents a day apart was getting to him. But then after I picked him up, he told me this. You know the loud pipes I told you about? I don't think it's pipes making that noise. Maybe I'm going insane, but I think the house is haunted. My grandfather used to tell me that the place was haunted right before he died of a heart attack. I'm starting to think whatever is in the house is the reason why my dad fell off that cliff. We drove back to the house and went inside. At that point, I was debating whether to take him to a shrink or just get him out of the house. I told him, Hey, come on, let's stay at my place tonight. But as soon as I said that, the floor started shaking and the front door slammed shut on its own, and I heard a voice say, Get out. But my friend didn't react at all. I was freaking out and begging him to come home with me, but he flat out refused. So I ran to my car alone and drove home. The next day I called to check on him. When I said something about the previous night and asked if he was okay, he said, What are you talking about? Yeah, you came over last night and we played cards, then you left. Nothing weird happened. How did he not remember what took place the night before? I tried to convince him over the phone and later over coffee in person about what happened the previous night, but he simply didn't believe me. After that conversation, I never heard from him again. I tried reaching out, but he ignored my every attempt to contact him. A year passed and I saw his obituary in the newspaper. It said he died of a brain aneurysm at the age of 38. I'm not sure whether he went crazy or if that house was demonic, and I'm not sure I'll ever know the answer. I went to an old military school in the Midwest that was founded in 1844, and this is what happened to me one night while pulling guard duty back in 1979. I volunteered for the 2 to 4 a.m. shift in one of the older buildings. By 11 p.m., most people on campus were already asleep, so I was on my own. Part of my duty meant I had to log everything that happened into a giant ledger, and it would later be reviewed by the Commandant. If you answered the phone, you logged it. If I had to run to fetch someone, you logged it. If I went to the bathroom, you logged it. You get the idea. You were only allowed to study, read, or shine your shoes in brass. No radio, no TV. You had to stay awake and alert in case something happened, like someone trying to go AWOL, a fire, or a medical emergency. So there I was, all alone reading a book. When out of the blue, I heard what sounded like a large group of cadets running down the stairs. Then came the sound of the double courtyard doors opening as bodies slammed against them. Officers were shouting orders, and I heard the band warming up in the courtyard. I looked at the clock on the wall, and it said 3.15 a.m. Confused, I got up and walked out of the office and through the double doors. But the moment I walked out onto the porch, there was silence. Nothing. It was the middle of the night, yet I had just heard a full core formation. There was a large heavy light hanging from the porch ceiling. It was connected by chains, one on each corner, and it was swinging like there were gale force winds hitting it. And yet, there was no wind. I thought, well, that was odd. I took one last look around, went back into the office, and logged it in the book. 3.15 a.m. Heard a core formation in the courtyard with band. No action taken. I never told any of my friends what happened. They would just say I had an overactive imagination. And as far as I know, no one said anything about my log entry either. I guess I'm the only one that heard it or cared. 
my take on the whole thing is that there are echoes captured in the walls of the school. A lot of things happen through the years in that school, so of course things leave an imprint. God, I miss that place. I work at the Myrtles Plantation and have a lot of ghost stories. It's located about a two-hour drive outside of New Orleans, and it's said to be one of the most haunted plantations in the country. It's also a bed and breakfast, and you can sleep there overnight. One of the rooms is filled with creepy ceramic dolls. One of them was the favorite of a little girl who died in the house back in the day. We were told she always slept with that doll in bed at night, and we still keep the doll on that bed in her memory. One of the first people that I checked in when I first started here removed the doll from the bed so they could get more comfortable. In the morning, they found the doll was back in bed with them and it had its hands on the woman's throat. She was furious and came downstairs accusing the staff of sneaking into her room at night and doing that. But none of us had been in her room that night. Why would we? The next guest removed the doll as well. He told me when he was sleeping, he heard tapping and movement on the wooden floor. He turned on the bedside lamp, only to find the doll standing on the floor right where the sound was coming from. Everyone who stays in that room and puts the doll away finds out that that doll will reclaim its rightful place in bed. This is one of my own stories. I'd been hearing about the Myrtles Plantation for years. So when I was in New Orleans, I convinced my friend to drive us to St. Francisville where it's located. They give ghost tours of the place and I really wanted to see a ghost. And then on the way back, I wanted to stop in Baton Rouge to go to the state capitol building because you can still see the bullet holes in the wall from where former Governor Huey Long was shot and killed in 1935. Yeah, I'm weird that way. So we drive and drive and drive, get to the plantation, and there's no one there but us. We tell the guide we want a tour, and the lady starts telling us about the history of the house. But just the history stuff. Nothing spooky. So after about ten minutes, I politely stop her and say, Uh, what about the ghosts? She tells me, Oh, this is just the history tour. The ghost tours are only done around Halloween. Well, it was May. I pointed out that there were only the two of us here, and we drove all this way just to see the ghosts. So she relaxed and started telling us about the ghosts. We were asking a bunch of questions, and I knew there was a painting somewhere of the former lord of the manor, and it supposedly made some people faint when they looked at it. So she points it out to me, and while she's explaining the history of it to my friend, I go up to it, get in close, go to the left, go to the right. I'm eyeballing this thing and nothing's happening. So the guide looks at my friend and laughs and points to me and says, Look, she's actually upset that she's not fainting. And I said, Uh, yeah. I came all this way to see a ghost and have something happen, so yes, I'm disappointed. We weren't allowed to go up into the bedrooms because they had guests. They weren't there at the moment, but their stuff was there, so it was a no-go. The tour guide was lovely. She was really nice and she let us look around on our own, but nothing ghostly happened. I was very disappointed. The bullet holes in the state capitol turned out to be another disappointment. I mean, they're literally just holes in a marble wall. I don't know what I was expecting. Something exciting, I guess. They're hidden away in a back hallway by the offices, and we never would have found them on our own. I finally found a secretary and asked where they were. She took us to the back hallway and pointed them out. We stood there for a minute or two and then left. On the drive back to New Orleans, I looked at my friend and said, We're a couple of idiots. We just drove a four-hour round trip to look at a painting and some holes in a wall. But it was really nice spending the day together.
If you have some ghost stories of your own that you'd like to share, disappointing or otherwise, you can always find my email at the end of every video and in the description below. Thank you so much for listening tonight. Now click or tap on the screen above to hear more stories like this so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends.